recording this session. So just to advise you, we're recording this session as a matter of courtesy as well. So hello, my name is Patrick Downs and I'm your host here this morning. And uh, the masterclass is another one in the series that we've been having and producing uh, over the last year. Um, and it's hosted by the Institute of Management Consultants and Advisors, which as most of you will know, is the internationally accredited body representing the consulting profession here in Ireland. So um, I guess to advise you, we'll be sending you a link so you don't have to take too many notes uh, after the event and uh, with our details and also a recording of this. So I mean, in fairness to Danielle, she's going to be sharing a lot of deep insights and a lot of knowledge and so on. So uh, you'll be able to recalibrate that and look at it again in your own good time. And thank you for allowing us to do that, Danielle. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge. And again, I know it's not a, a me you're here to see. So just a couple of housekeeping items before we kick off. Look, I'm delighted, uh, particularly this morning, we have this really global audience with us. And uh, I particularly welcome uh, those that are joining via the audio link, which is growing, uh, funnily enough, uh, over the last couple of weeks. And I would especially like to recognize our president, uh, John Byrne, who is here with us uh, this morning. And indeed, a big Cade Mila Falcha to our consulting colleagues from across the globe and the CMC colleagues as well, and particularly those from Canada and the subcontinents who are joining us here this morning. Uh, and again, just to double check, can I ask everyone to make sure that you're muted uh, before we, we take the ship out? Um, for information, as I said earlier, we're recording and from a GDPR point of view, you need to be clear on that. So if you have any issues, it would be a good time uh, to step off deck um, because we will be disseminating the information uh, further. And you would have, when you came on board, um, check that link so that you're okay with that. So, <laughs> excuse me, for those of you who have any questions for Danielle, um, we're using the chat box facility at the bottom of your screen. So you, you can see that down there. Um, so we'll use that facility to um, harvest any questions you may have during the course of the presentation. And Danielle will address them as we, as we proceed and at the end of the presentation. And, and equally, we'll be running a few polls during this presentation. So please keep an eye out for them. And uh, it'd be appreciated if you could participate when they come up so we can just get a, a sense of what your, your feelings are about the particular issues that are gonna be raised by Danielle. So all that being said, look, delighted uh, for Danielle to be joining with us and sharing her deep knowledge and insights this morning. Um, we're very lucky. Um, I came across Danielle um, a while back in TU Hothouse, and she's worked across multiple sectors such as administration, tourism, education, general management, marketing, and business development, which is a broad canvas of experience to bring to the table here this morning to share her knowledge with us. And that's been over the last 20, 20 odd years. And, you know, she's really gained some deep uh, commercial and industrial knowledge that she's really cascaded into the whole digital uh, piece. And that's been across an international and a national and a local space and I, I guess it's fair to say that she's been an advocate for the whole uh, SME digital pivot over the period and you know website development and management and she's been really kind of pushing that boat out for quite a while she was probably first of breed in that space and she's been um, you know raising the urgency for SMEs to get involved in this space and really ramp up their participation in the digital uh, kind of arena. And I guess her time has come and our time has come as well. And to that end, she's currently marketing manager for, uh, for TU Dublin Hothouse, which some of you would know. And it's which, as I said, where I met her. Uh, and she's responsible for the whole marketing and management of the Hothouse brand there, which is a big beast. Um, so clearly she's bringing a, a lot of practical and both a practical and academic experience. So look, we're gonna talk, or she's gonna talk about all things digital this morning and ramping up your digital presence. And I was thinking about it earlier. And uh, it's interesting because this morning, um, back in 1977, I think it was the, the first space shuttle enterprise was launched and, and you know to boldly go where where no one has gone before and to that end we are in the middle of a pandemic where in living memory we haven't really uh, gone into this space before so with that in mind danielle and kind of with the the enterprise uh, aspect in your mind's eye i'm going to ask you to take the ship out and danielle akara the floor is yours <laughs> no pressure on things <laughs> thanks very much for the introduction. Um, welcome everyone. I am I very much like interactive presentations and lectures. Uh, so if you do have if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll answer them. Um, if I see something popping up in front of me, unfortunately I'm working off a couple of screens, so sometimes I miss them, but if not, we'll get to them at the end anyway. So as Pat said, I am the marketing manager for TU Dublin and TU Dublin Hotshouse. So TU Dublin Hotshouse is the knowledge transfer office for TU Dublin. So what's a knowledge transfer office? So a knowledge transfer office is 
the link between industry and research. If you wanted to do a research project with TU Dublin, you would come through either one of the schools, one of the research groups or centres, one of the researchers, but mostly you'd be directed to come to TU Dublin Hotchess because we are, I suppose, the facilitators between them and I'm the marketing manager for them. So my responsibility is to make sure that we get the word out, that people are aware of what we can do to help you to facilitate those industry engagement projects, but also to help the centres and the researchers market their own capabilities. And the event that we actually just did was to showcase that capabilities. So today we're going to be talking about, I suppose, what the best practice for digital marketing would be what medium PR maybe you should look at, where are your customers and demographics, that kind of stuff. Um, now, you mentioned at the start, um, Pat, that there were people from outside of the Irish market, which unfortunately I didn't realise, apologies. So my focus is on the Irish market and the demographics you'll see for there. However, the links that are in those demographics, they have every country in those. So if you want to look at your own country's demographics, all you have to do is click the links and reset outside of Ireland and go to your own country. But we'll talk a bit more of that, shall you? So this is our team. Um, we are kind of a diverse team of experts in different areas. We have people who are experts in agri, people who are experts in science. And we also have people who are experts in innovation and entrepreneurships. And they are the people who have worked in industry and they've gone back to study research or maybe engaged in a research project like myself. So I worked in industry for many years and then went to WISH in 2008 to do my master's in management actually at the time and realized that I really liked the, I suppose the combined mixed method approach for research. And there was an opportunity to work with a research center there. I took it and then 10 years later, <laughs> I was still there. But the job was really interesting because I got to work with thousands of companies on helping them develop their innovation, their products, their services, and to help them grow that into new markets. So while my focus might have been education or marketing or management, I actually have probably worked in every industry you can possibly imagine because of that um, opportunity. And if you ever do get the opportunity to work with research in that respect, I'd recommend this because it will give you a broader understanding of what you can do and how you can, I suppose, get involved with other industries that may help you grow your own business. So we're also part of something called DRIC. So DRIC is the Dublin Region Innovation Consortium and it combines DIAS, National College of Ireland and IADT and it's funded by Enterprise Ireland. So we hope to maximise the impact of research in each of our institutions and Hosh House is the lead partner of it. So if we don't have the capabilities to help you with your project, or the research in-house in TU Dublin, one of our other partners probably have it. So we make sure that you can get that project done within the area that you're looking for. So this is just kind of a highlight of some of the impact that we've done over the last couple of years. And we have a new report going into Knowledge Transference, which is one of our um, partners, one of the funders through Enterprise Ireland and through the European Union and they request every year that we submit in the impact. So I think last year we took in over a couple of million in projects and new spin outs. And as far as I'm aware, uh, based on the survey of the preliminary dash we just got back over the last three years, there's been an increase of about 60 jobs in just the innovation voucher project. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see how a small grant like an innovation voucher can help a business grow or something as small as a trading online voucher could help you bring into the new markets that you're looking for. And we're going to go into the funding options for you at the end of the session. So I'm going to skip over some of the services and that kind of stuff because we want to get into the digital marketing site. But just to give you an idea of what we offer, you know, we work with students, startups, entrepreneurs, researchers and industry. But we, our open labs will be our main focus for industry and we kind of cover food innovation, uh, product prototyping, VR, AR, um, data analysis, AI, uh, innovative so surface coatings, um, sustainable research, and we've just brought cybersecurity online as well. And then we also help with researchers, you know, in the IP area and licensing and our students are covered by uh, inventions and we also work with New Frontiers. So New Frontiers is available through 
Blanchestown, Tala and our own incubation centre. So we support that all through the Green My Hub. So the Green My Hub is our incubation centre on the Green Tourman campus, but Lincoln Synergy are also in Blanchestown and Tala. So if you are looking to get into the incubation space or maybe you're looking for assistance with the New Frontiers programme, any of us would be more than happy to have you. So now that we've done that, we'll do our first poll of the morning. So Pat, if you wouldn't mind sharing the first one, please. Okay, so what are your predictive trends for 2021? And I'm interested in what you think is going to happen in the next um, 12 months, I suppose. Okay, folks, come on, fingers on the buzzers here. Very quick responses there. So I'm seeing working from home and virtual events. Um, not so much in influencer marketing and visual search. So I'm going to talk about visual searching in a minute. No one on AI advertising, that's interesting. Okay, we're just going to end the poll now, folks, if that's okay. Yeah. Share it with you. Okay, so most people were focused on the virtual events and um, working from home. So that's fine. So why I push AI advertising and visual searching in is that one of the biggest trends that you're going to see this year um, on the omnichannel experience, which I'm going to explain in a second, is visual searching. Has anyone heard of product searching before? No. No. Okay, so no. I'm just. <laughs> it's just. Blank faces, I'm just looking at. Okay, product searching is really interesting. Right now, people search by typing it into Google. You know, I know we've got other search algorithms and there's other search programs, but really, we all Google it. And it's become so common, that's actually what we say. We don't say searching anymore, we say we Google it. Um, however, product searching and visual searching has is a new AI platform that you can use. It, it came on board about 2019. But it's a way for you to take your phone, take a picture of said product that you see. You might see someone walking down the street and you see them wearing something or using a product or service that you are really interested in. You can take a picture of it and it's an image search and it's built in through an AI bot. Mostly it's an Android feature, but they are bringing more and more into the iPhone site. And you can scan that specific product and they'll do a full search based on that image and bring you back to the direct link for purchase options. So the more that you get into omni-channel marketing, the better it is for your product opportunities. So what is omni-channel marketing? Well, it's an experience to multi-channel approach to marketing. It's marketing, selling, and serving customers in a way that creates an integrated and cohesive customer experience. So no matter how the customer reaches you or where they look for you, they can find you. So for example, if you were sharing content um, with on your multiple platforms. You need to make sure that the customers can find you and engage with those through various mediums. So it's not just your website. It's not just your offline um, channels. It's not just your social platforms. It's wherever the customer you can think of that they can connect with you. Down to business sites, down to chat functions. It's the whole integrated platform approach and sharing the same consistent message. So if your message is not consistent, your customer will not benefit from the omni-channel experience. They're not going to understand what you're trying to say and they're actually going to lose interest in your product, your service and your brand itself. So by having that consistent message throughout all of your platforms, all of your branding, it gives them a sense of cohesiveness in your brand, but also they connect more with it and they tend to show more loyalty when it's a cohesive message. So on the content side, what should you be sharing? So you've got the, sorry, apologies. You've got the content and you've got context. So what does that mean? You can either go through the live recorded interactive or voice active. So right now we're in a live content shared experience. And this morning I shared on our Twitter and LinkedIn platforms that I'm going to be talking to you. That's context to what we're talking about today. The IMCA also shared the content and the context of the event bright to connect in with this event this morning. That's relevant content that they were sharing and I tagged us in it. So we are co-sharing an event and co-sharing the context of said event. 
and this event is live and it's going to be recorded so we're actually going to share that video after the event with the relevant parties who couldn't attend or maybe the people to hear. I'm also going to give you content from the PDF I'm going to send you with the links built into it. So we've had a small multi-channel approach for marketing this morning. It's a very limited approach, but it's actually brought you in to join us for this event this morning. So what I mean by video is not an option anymore is we are working from home. Everyone is using the video, but the video is not an option anymore means that every single platform you use should have some sort of stream attached to it whether it's a shared podcast, whether it's live blog contents, whether it's video, whether it's YouTube, you need to share content with your people, with your followers, with your customers, so they can engage more with you and also purchase the products that you're talking about or the services or processes. So there's multiple tools you can use for that. But the biggest one and the best one I can recommend is YouTube. YouTube is live sharing platform. You can go live stream from it. It connects into every single platform that's out there. It embeds into every single website. And it also allows you to embed into Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, the whole lot of it. We're going to talk about another platform later, but right now I just want you to focus on YouTube. YouTube is also the leading platform worldwide for social media. So the tools that I'm also recommending are Canva, Hootsuite, Calendar, and Pixabay. So why I'm recommending specifically Canva and Pixabay. Pixabay has common creative license, so CTL free pictures, as long as you recognize that you're sharing a picture from a CCL. You can alter it, but you, um, you have no ownership of it, but they will, are, it's free to use, you do not need to pay for it. Canva is a tool that I use and honestly, I have Adobe in design the whole lot, but I find Canva so much easier to use and obviously, and a lot better. And I think I paid 99 euros for the year for it, but it has everything you need in it. It builds platforms, it builds presentations, it builds videos, it builds designs, um, everything that you can need to do. And even if you have no design background, this will actually do it for you because it populates the designs for you. Now, if you're a designer like I am, then you can go on the other side and build from scratch, but they actually have templates within that. And I really couldn't recommend it higher enough. If you take nothing away from today, have a look at Canva if you need to design something. Okay, so right now I want to talk to you about organic and paid um, searching. So have you ever heard of paid and organic searching? No, people are shaking their heads now. Okay, so if you are online and you search for something, that's organic searching. If you're typing into your Google search bar and you're saying, where can I find company? Where can I find product? Where can I find or where do I go, or can you recommend? That's organic searching. If I was to do paid searching, I would be publishing the very first post that you see in your search optimization is that paid search. And you can see that it's a paid ad because they actually dedicate the term paid ad to it or it's sponsored or whichever way they want to promote it. If you get organic search and you're in the front first page from organic search, you've got really strong SEO. If you're not in the first page of your Google searches or your Bing searches or uh, whatever um, Edge or Chrome or um, whatever platform or search optimizations that you're using, if you're not in that first page, you're not going to get any error with your customers. So you are to make sure that your SEO is so strong that you get there. And how you do that is by keywords and referral linking. The more people talk about you online, the more people will refer back into you. So if you have keywords on your website and the keywords don't make any sense, if people aren't searching for those keywords, then they're not going to find you. But if you've got keywords and you've got tags built in and you've got your pictures are tagged correctly. So all of these little things that you do on your website or your social platforms will keep people finding you in the certain areas. So if we take a very basic business and the business is selling um, shoes, okay? And they're selling ladies fashion shoes and the shoes are um, from say they're kind of, mid-range shoes. The shoes themselves, if you type in shoes, everything in the world is going to come up. So no one's going to find you. If you type in lady shoes, you're not going to get hit for that as well. If you type in um, 
mid-price shoes, you're still not going to get hit. So you're probably thinking, well, okay, now you've kind of restricted on what we're saying. How am I supposed to get that point across? Well, it might be that you are handmade in your location. It might be that you make high-end, um, specialized, personalized shoes. It might be that you are the one person in the world that sells using whatever base product it is, and that's your thing. So that's what you become synonymous with. You have a USB that people understand, and that's what your key search term is. So people and your customers in particular will continue to search for that. And the more people search for it, the higher in your organic search you'll go. So to do that, you need to have obviously a sales pitch online, um, either through an e-commerce site, through Messenger app or WhatsApp, or you're using a third party site if you cannot build your own website right now. Third party sites are about 15 euros to 30 euros a month. And the recommendation is to be on at least one of them. So if you can afford the 15 euros a month, Weebly is probably your best bet for that. If you can go a little bit further and build an e-commerce site, Shopify is about 30 euros um, a month and Shopify has all the built-in um, options for it. However, Amazon is another way for you to do it. Amazon's probably the leader. It's, <laughs> Patrick and I were, were discussing together, it's a little bit difficult to build a platform together. They do have people who can assist you with it. Um, but yeah, the, it's a little bit more difficult than the other areas. And if you're not comfortable with building a site, um, I recommend looking at their how-to guide to do it. Um, but if you get on Amazon, then you're across the board, people will find you because that's what people are doing. And honestly, that's all people are doing at the moment is just purchasing from that, um, purchase from home. But there are other options for you. Facebook has an amazing e-commerce marketplace. WhatsApp, you can sell through Instagram, like any of your social platforms, they all have free options for you to sell. As long as your shipping costs are covered and your prices are included, then why not? Why not just get yourself onto one of these sites and start there? You don't need to have just-in-time system. You don't need to have any of the other stuff. As long as your product is available for sale, find a platform that you're comfortable with and sell through it. Make sure it's through your business page. Make sure it's through your business account. Don't use your personal account because you're never going to be able to build your customer loyalty. And the, you're in breach of some of the guidelines for social media anyway by using your personal account. But if you're on, even taking Facebook as your starting point, Marketplace is free to use. So why not use it? I mean, it's really simple. You're posting a picture, you post the content about it, and that's it. You can sell. You're online selling. You haven't had to put a lot of time and effort into it you're getting your message across and you're selling to the specific location. So I recommend you take a look at it. There's other platforms. I've given you a list of them there, but start with Marketplace and see where you go from there. Okay, so at that point, if you're online, how do you get your message across? How do you tell people about who it is and who you're trying to get um, your product to? Who are your customers? Well, okay, maybe you don't know. Maybe you are unaware of Facebook is not the right meeting for you. Maybe your Gen Z is actually your, your marketing um, capabilities and that's who you need to talk to. Uh, okay, well then how do I get the platforms to it? Where are they located? If you look at the actual customers, sorry, apologies, didn't mean to click that. There's a load of different options for you. And we're going to go into demographics in a couple of slides that you can do. So there's multiple platforms, multiple um, websites that you can use. Sorry. Sorry about that. I was just getting a lot of feedback there. Um, there are multiple platforms you can use. Um, the one that I recommend over everyone is MailChimp. So if you have an opportunity to share a MailChimp, it gives you direct um, access to your customers. It sends them the messages that you want to do and you know they're receiving it because it's going into their emails. Um, if you can get them to sign up, it's great. They have loads of templates you can use. It's also free for you to send up to 2,000 emails a day so you can build a really good base. And you can separate out your customers into the different specifics. So if they're only interested in one of your products, then you can have just an email zine or an e-zine to them 
for that specific product, service, or process. If they're interested in your company wider, then you have a general one. You can break it down into different ones. The best thing I can say about if you're doing email marketing is to make sure that you experiment to see what resonates with them. So you might send them content that you think is amazing, but no one's engaging with it. So test out different ones. And the one thing that I would say, and this is from personal experience, follow a pre-send checklist. I can't stress this enough. The amount of times I've sent something and seen a spelling mistake, no matter how many times I read it, there's a spelling mistake in it. I could have read it 10 times and there's still that one spelling mistake and it actually drives you insane. And then your customers are after seeing this and there's a spelling mistake in it. So your, your pre-send checklist is make sure you have at least two people checking, even if they're family members, just reading it for you. Um, make sure that all of the buttons are working. So you've got track and measure built into it, you know, that you have the analytics, so you can see that they're opening it. Make sure that everything, if the link is, if you're putting links into it, make sure your links are working. There's a very specific pre-send checklist and make sure you do it. And then personalize your email. So personalize them to the customer themselves. Don't just have a generic, any content will do. Make sure when you're talking to the customers, you're actually talking to them. And use the analytics. So there's multiple analytics built into MailChimp, um, but you can also use the, um, if you have a website, you can use like the, the Google Analytics. Um, you can use social media platforms. They have all free analytics built in there. there. So make sure that you're measuring all the time and that you're tracking it because this will help bring up your search engine optimization as well, which is your rankings, um, which will bring up awareness of your brand and your brand awareness for your customers will help you sell. So that if we were to talk about paid media and earned media, um, we're going to do this one and then we're going to do another poll. And so the paid media and earned media, there's something called own media, earned media and paid media. So the own media is when you leverage a channel um, that you create and control. This could be your blog or your, your YouTube channel. It could be your website. It could even be any of your social platforms. So even though you don't strictly like own these platforms, you own those pages on them. And that is your own way to share content. You own the, con the information that comes out from it. You own the videos, the blogs, the content that's shared, that is your own media. So when people share it, they have to refer it back to you. Earned media, however, is when customers or the press or public share your content and talk about your brand, talk about your products and services. And really that's what you want. You want that earned media. The more earned media you get, the higher your SEO goes, the higher the loyalty of your customers and the more engagement. So in other words, what you're looking, sorry, in other words, what you're looking for is the, um, the voluntary discussions that you're getting from your customers, the voluntary posts, the voluntary um, engagements. People trust other customers more so than they do the company or paid media. So you want that our media and you want to, I suppose, respond to that by offering loyalty options to them, by thanking them, by maybe sending them a little something on their birthday, because there's a lot of ways you can track their information and they respond to that. You're not paying them off. You're just saying thank you for being a loyal customer. Um, however, you can pay for media. So you can advertise on your third party channels like social media websites. You can do paid marketing like influencers and social media pieces. Now, I'm not a fan of influencer marketing. It's, I always find this, it cheapens your brand when you find an influencer um, because they expect a lot Whereas if you were to pay for um, Google or pay for even to do a media piece, like journalists, you can pay journalists to come and evaluate your location or your product or services. That's a paid media that you can do and they'll do a spotlight feature for you. Um, but influencer marketing, it's effective. It is effective, but I'm not a fan of it. So it's something that you need to have a look at and think is your brand, is influencer marketing something that you want to use for your brand? Because that's going to be what your brand then is associated with said influencer. And if they damage your brand, then that's going to be a problem for you. And with the rise in the platforms for Gen Z, the more it's more and more influencer marketing you're going to see there where they're paid to demonstrate your product or service. So think about it. Is influencer marketing suitable for what your brand is? Okay, so before we go into media relations, would you mind posting the next poll for me, please, Patrick? 
Twitter thing. Um, so we're just going to share the uh, poll now. So fingers on the triggers. And uh, I have to say, Danielle, I am that sinner where and stuff has been sent out and the spell check was a little bit adrift and I'm going to blame mm -hmm. the spell check on occasion. Um, and I see just a question on influencer marketing. Is it more suitable to kind of certain sectors over, you know, and other products relative to say, professional services where a lot of consultants would be in the space of? Absolutely. I would probably say you're looking at the beauty industry for influencer marketing. Mm. Uh, products like um, makeup, hairstyles, you know, anything that they can demonstrate before and after, that's very much influencer marketing. Clothing is very much an influencer marketing. Professional services, I'm trying to think if I ever seen anyone do a professional service one before. I think um, perhaps kind of referrals are more strong if I if I kind of differentiate yeah. between referrals and influencer marketing. Um, yeah, so influencer marketing is when you take a person who is well known, so who's really good at influencer marketing. It would be like um what are those those girls called the Kardashians, the Kardashians, um, do you know that that family? Mm -hmm. um, so anything that they do product development for or anything that they show in their show, they're actually influencer marketing. That They're being paid to showcase those. Now, we're going to talk about a platform in uh, you know, okay. three or four slides, so we'll go into that in more detail. But yeah, the professional services, you're more likely to get someone from, I swear, from the sports in uh, sports um, to come and give you, a, 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 like, do a discussion. Sure. Of, their perspective in rather than influencer marketing yeah so i would say it is it does lend itself to so so thank you and we're going to close the poll now so there's a clear winner by the looks of things so i'll let you share that information okay so linkedin is showing up from 71 percent of what it is what i find interesting is the messenger is only five percent so you might not have a facebook um page but messenger is definitely something we should be looking at for you um, I'm also not seeing um, Twitter as a leading one as well, which I find interesting because I presume you're all businesses in this room who have a business LinkedIn, but you don't have a Twitter account. Is it that the, you don't think demographics are there? You can prove it in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. So the media relations is just the last one I want to talk to you about before we go into the demographics and the breakdown. So why I think media relations is really important is it gets your information out there through your different ones. So I've given you a list of options for to get on the good side, I suppose, of journalists and the papers that they work with and the journals, magazines as well. So something like the Irish Times, the Sunday Business Post, uh, Silicon Republic. Um, there's a lot of them that we use in Ireland that we would actually pitch to them. So if you're going to send them information, there's a couple of ones that I want you to focus on. So focus on the right people. While you're sending a generic news piece, no one's going to pay attention to it. But if you find a journalist that you actually like and is in your industry and they talk about your, your specific industry and they understand what they're, what they're speaking about and you send them a piece about a new product or service that you're launching or maybe it's something that's happened that you want people to be aware of or maybe it's new developed in it they're the people who are actually going to push that information out but if you send it to a generic news say news talk at you know genericnews.com no one's going to really pick up on it because they might not understand it particularly if you lean towards the scientific or the technological if you're speaking to the wrong people they're never going to share it because they just don't understand what you're trying to say but if you find the right person and you find the right person in your industry who is a leading journalist in that area and get your message there that's when you're actually going to get that shared content that you're looking for but make sure you pitch to them like you would be pitching to a journalist so they don't want to say as beast they don't want to see oh all these happy happy things are happening they want this is what happened this is where it's going this is why we're sharing this news. This is how you can follow up with us. And then you give them editor notes. So if they want to follow up to you, an editor notes section for a press release actually gives them the opportunity to find out more about you, find out who your key interview people are, and maybe share that information out there. But what I would say is start to make notes on the people who you contact. So if you're contacting journalists or contacting um, the news desk or whatever it is, and you start to notice a trend that, oh, person X actually really likes when I email them in the morning, I get that information. They must work in the morning. 
start making notes on those because if you start making notes and getting more and more interactivity with those people, you start to build a relationship with them. So you know that when you send that information to them, that information is going to get out. So for us, I have relationships with different journalists and different authors in different areas across the European Union because that's where our market is. But we also have people in the American markets and in the Chinese markets and the Asian markets because our scientists actually are looking for patent developments in those areas and they're looking for partners. So we need to make sure that we're not just focused on the Irish market, that we actually share the content. So we find different journalists or different papers that we need to get to and that's how we do it. We also have a media rollout. So we know that we need to pitch early we know that we need to be effective in who we target. So you need to start thinking about that as well. So if you're looking at the actual area, can you become a thought leader in your area? Are you a specialist in your area? Can you talk about your specific product, service or process or maybe your business in a wider context of your industry? Why is your product, service or process going to help your customer base? And how can you maybe partner with another person or company to expand and to help solve the customer's issues. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, that's okay. Okay, so if you're doing that, then what platform should you be using? So let's talk about saturation. Right now, this was from the ages of 16 to 64, it was taken by the CSO, by um, Wolfgang Dichtel and a couple of other people, Hootsuite, came together and they do a survey every year. These are the very latest statistics and the demographics I'm going to give you are about last year's and into January 2021. As you can see, 88.5% of people in Ireland use YouTube. And these are the daily users. So no matter where you use it, you might actually be on the YouTube platform, but you search, when you do an image search or where you do a video search, it's YouTube videos are coming back to you. So if you're a business and you don't have your channel built, that's the first thing I recommend you do. So you can upload your videos. So no matter what, when they search, they can find those videos there. But they also have, and as you can see by the poll, that WhatsApp was an important feed. Can you see the, the amount of people who are using WhatsApp right now? 78.9%. How many people use WhatsApp here? Yeah, hands, I see hands good. Okay, so your WhatsApp, I presume you only use it for personal use, yeah? Yeah. It's a way for you to sell to your customers and it gives them an opportunity to do it. And it's free. You can do free calls, free text messages. You can share content, the whole lot. You can build a database of people where you can send automated text messages to your group issues. You can send private messages. There's loads of different things you can do with WhatsApp. It's not the most secure, but it is the most readily available and everyone uses it. People understand the text messages that come through WhatsApp, but you also have the opportunity to do Facebook Messenger, which is much more secure. Facebook Messenger, even if you don't have a Facebook account, you can use Messenger, but I'd recommend you have a base Facebook account that you can just, you can close off. You can have a private account on Facebook and just have a Messenger one because you can build bots into your Messenger and actually show people that you're interacting with them. However, we're going to look at the demographics now to make sure that your people are actually in those areas. So these are the Irish users in, from January 2021. So what I'm showing you here is the population versus what they're using and how they're using it. And then these are the actual audiences we're about to go into. I've given you the links in each of them. So you can click in and you can click into your own specific area. But right now we're going to be talking about the Irish market. So Twitter, this is the saturation from January 2021 and the increase in it. So 1 million daily users, just over a million daily users. That's uh, the audience itself has grown and you can see that it's mostly female versus male. We've got kind of a 60, 40 split for Twitter and, um, and it has changed. When I initially started, Twitter was very much a male oriented. Now you're probably talking about a 70, 30 split for, for Twitter. But because the businesses have become more engaged on Twitter, we've actually seen an increase. And now we're at the point where Twitter has, is uh, the female, I suppose, population, particularly 
leaves is 35 to 44, which is me. Hi. Yeah, we're leading in the areas for Twitter. So if you want to speak to my generation, you want to speak to those millennials, that's where we are. We're on there. We have nothing better to do than look at tweets all day long because they are funny. They're humorous. They break us out of the monotony of what we're doing. And also they gave us the news, they give us the product demonstrations. It's a very quick and easy way to get your information out there. But we're also on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn has also seen an increase. So while the male generation, once again, were leading in LinkedIn, they had about an 80-20 split when I first started back in, God, I'm trying to think, it might have been 2010 I started on LinkedIn. Uh, I would have to check that, but uh, there was maybe, I think in my, actually, this is when it started, so it would have been 2010. Um, in my master's class, there was 90 in my year and about 20 of us were female. So there was kind of 70 males that were all encouraged to sign up for LinkedIn and 20 females. And you can see that shift is going, but there are more and more people using LinkedIn for their own, uh, I suppose, their own personal views. If I can tell you anything, do not use LinkedIn for your own personal views. Do not share content that's personal. Do not share content that is not relevant to business needs. LinkedIn is a business platform only. The more people that share personal information, the less interaction you're going to get from your customers. Customers use other platforms for personal sharing. Keep business topics only. Keep topics relevant to your industry and content that you want shared that you would want people to understand about you. If you have a business page, don't ever share political, don't ever share um, topical stuff. If something's happening and you want to talk about it and if it's not relevant to your industry, use your own personal platforms. Do not use your business platforms for that because you're going to damage your brand. And LinkedIn is only for business. That's what it's built for. There's hundreds of platforms you can use if you want to share personal views. So make sure that you become an influencer, but not, not in a bad way. Make sure you become a thought leader for your industry because you're sharing content that's relevant. Facebook. So Facebook, uh, I would say Facebook is probably saturated in the market. Um, however, the business pages are still really strong there and then they lead into the Facebook Messenger and you can sell through it. But your market is very much a split um, in the older market. So if you're looking to speak to 35 to 44, 44 is to, I suppose, 55s and maybe 55 pluses, Facebook is your market. If you're looking for anyone younger, Facebook is not your, your sales market. They only use it to come on to Facebook Messenger to message your friends. Snapchat, TikTok, YouTube, and other platforms are actually where your lower than 35s are. We are all using it and to go on and talk to our friends. We're not really looking from the sales part unless it's in the marketplace area. Um, but they do have two and a half, over two and a half million users, daily users but they are in the older generation. So if we are your older generation, then that's where your market is. And lastly, we're going to talk about webinars. So before I move into webinars, you can see that I've only given you Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. If you look at the link that I've given you, every single platform is there. I've only chosen three to showcase today because obviously we could go in for hours upon hours on every single platform. But if there's a specific platform that you would like to know about and I haven't shown you today, I'm happy to go over it with you. You can send me an email after this or you can ask me at the end about the other platforms. But you can also do your own research in the specific link from Wolfgang Digital because they have all of them there, like Instagram or Snapchat or any of those. The one that I would say to you um, is that they haven't got any information on it are the newer ones that are breaking out like TikTok because they just don't have the data yet. They have some of the statistics, but I would say it's probably going to be next year before we get the actual data. So webinars. I love webinars, but you, we're also starting to get kind of fed up with webinars as well. You know, every single meeting you go to might as well be a webinar because, you know, could that meeting have been an email? Yeah, probably. But people are starved for interaction. So we have, you know, five, six, seven meetings a day. However, your customers are not the same as your business connections. So they love them. They love to hear from you. They like the interaction. And video marketing accounts for about 75% of all traffic that we see on the internet. So whether it's a quick snapshot, whether it's a live stream, whether it's just a pop-up, whether it's just a webinar, 
the larger your footprint is, the better your SEO is. So um, look at the, doing a webinar, even if it's a weekly webinar or it's a monthly webinar, whatever it is, get into the practice of doing something. So for us, we do a webinar probably once a month, but we actually do, I'd say we do about six or seven, but most of them are internal. So we would be speaking to a specific audience, but the one that we share out to the wider audience, that's the one we do on a monthly basis. And we find a topic that they're interested in. Could be on how to protect your IP, could be on, you know, just the basic what funding options are available for my business. We find a topic for the month and then we share that. So what is your authority for your area? Increase your brand awareness by not selling, but actually making sure that when they think, oh, you know, I need to know more about that specific thing. Oh, I know I'll go to company X's page because they've shared that information and they talk really well about this and they speak with authority and, and I trust them and I'm going to purchase from them. That's how you do it. However, the one thing I would say is do not launch your product through a webinar. If you're launching a product, make sure you do a viral video, yes, but not a webinar. People don't come to a webinar to hear you launch a product. They come to a webinar to learn something from you, to get information and not to be sold to. So while you can sell because you're discussing the options for said product or service or process, you're not there to actually sell to them. You want to talk around it. You nearly want them to come back and ask you to sell them to them. If you're doing your job well, they'll come back and say, oh, I saw that you were showcasing company X or product Y or you know, process Z. Can you tell me more about that? And that's what you want from them. So do interviews, do panel discussions, do thought leading um, tutorials. Do something that's going to engage your customers, but do not sell to them. Do not do just a generic news PR piece because that's not what a webinar is. A webinar is like we're doing right now. I'm speaking with you. We're going to have a QA and a after the end of it. And hopefully, if I've done my job well, you're learning something from the webinar. Okay, so let's have a bit of fun. And um, hopefully this works. I'm going to press play. <laughs> I am, and we're going to talk about why the campaigns, why I like them. So first of all, can you hear this? You hear that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to pause you there and the link will be in there. So what this is, is the Jerusalem dance. And it's a TikTok um, craze that went insane um, last year. But it's this why the, you're seeing on Garda Shekhana dancing right now is because the Swiss police challenged them to do it. So if you want to see more about it, you can click into the Swiss police challenge and then the response to this. So why did it work and why did it, I suppose, drop for the, the Angarda Shikona? So they're after getting a lot of bad press. You know, they are the, the, the peacekeepers between us and the COVID challenges. They stop us on the roads. They are constantly finding us and sending us home. But honestly, they're trying to do their job and they get so much bad press and the people out there who are doing the negative press are not working. However, they responded to the Switch Challenge, they responded to a TikTok viral video, and they made this. And the impact that it, it's just some crazy people are searching on Cardiff Street Corner from every location in the world because it's one of the best ones that's done it. They even have horses dancing in it, which I, I laugh so hard at. They, you know, it's it's done really well. And at the very start of it, if you notice, they actually have a Swiss car coming in and they're blocking them to go access to it. So they've done it really well because it's, you know, it's humorous, it's authentic, it's authentic, it's responsive, it's interactive, and they're using a platform that actually everyone has been really, I suppose, gone crazy for. 
And now there's been a, just a spate of Jerusalem dances through, you know, on Post have done it, you know, Spire have done them, Centra, you know, um, I saw a lot of the nursing homes and the hospitals and stuff like that. And I saw one yesterday from, it might have been like Pfizer or one of the, the pharmaceutical companies. I, I Sorry, Bosch and Om. Bosch and Om did one yesterday. So you see more and more people interactive. And this is a way for them to break the monotony that they have from work from home. Uh, but they also then connect your brand. So if you can use TikTok for your own user generated content, make sure that you are showcasing authenticity. Make sure you're using your phone or your video. People, that's what people understand. Make sure that you're using um, content that you've developed yourself and you can also be part of that craze. You can also develop your own hashtag. So if your hashtag is something that you want to use um, for it, make sure that you understand the medium for it if you're on one of the platforms. So the next one I want to show you, um, and this is only after happening, I think it was last week, and it's fantastic and I love it. And this is why, um, by the way, we're on Twitter. Can you hear this? Okay, so the premise behind this, because the music, it's, it's not relevant. The premise behind this is Wheat, Bex and Beans posted, um, a, a, a posted a tweet saying, Wheat, Bex and Beans is the new content. And <laughs> over 140 companies to date have responded, but they were really, really quick. And they really got into it and they use humor and debatability for on twitter for it so there's everyone starts to get into it you start seeing other brands you start seeing search optimization you know um but they they <laughs> Sorry, the, I'm still laughing at this, as you can see by some of the comments. If you want to look at the video, you can actually see them all, or you can go to Twitch and see the full breakdown on it. But you got to see the increase, the increase that they got of their followers and the comments on it was just crazy. Um, so I'm going to just stop it there. So why did it work for them? They understood the medium really well. They understood that um, they post something that has an option for debatability and honestly that's a word that we need to debate is that an actual word because it sounds false but it's not what I mean by debatability is can you post something that people will interact with can you post something that they're going to say no I never do that that's ridiculous but have a bit of fun with it so wheat bex and beans were the fun and then they went further and did wheat bex and innocent smoothies and they were saying they responded to Kellogg saying you know milk is so last season like and they were playing with it but they were topical humorous and quick and timely. Timely was really important. If you're on Twitter and you take a couple of days to respond to a tweet, it's not gonna work for you. That's why if you're doing a campaign like this, you need to have a couple of people helping you out that they can have the responses and to be smart without being rude, to be topical without being disruptive. You know, you need to be careful with which way you go with it. And Weechbex did it really well. So, I suppose Twitter and, and TikTok are where the generations are right now. And they're probably the two platforms that are gaining more and more traction across the, me the medium. While TikTok used to be for the Gen Z platforms for the under 34s and honestly for the 18 to 24s, the millennials, so the the thirty, the over 30s are really after stepping into the platform. And it's one that I recommend you have a look at. And it is fantastic for selling your products because you're selling your products without selling your products you can go on and i'm going to just showcase my lip state pink zero here and i could just be chatting away to you and take my drink but at all times you can see my lip state pink zero in here um and on the lip state sponsorship now for doing this today no but you can see like i'm just chatting away to you and you can see the different things and this is how tiktok works i'm talking to you right now but you can actually see that product in the background i've also got my stand behind me now the stand is a very um obvious sales pitch but i haven't mentioned the stand at all until we got to this point but you can see the logos and you see the offerings that we do well you would if my head wasn't in the way but do you know what I mean? Like you don't need to sell your products. Like you can just talk. Or if we take the other one, sorry, I have a load of drinks in front of me, which is why I'm using products. Yeah, and I might have my Coke Zero in my hands. So what product can you use? If you don't have a service that you're offering, maybe use the service to do your TikTok. Maybe that's how you do your TikTok. Your TikTok could be that you know how to, like there's people on there showing you how to clean your phones, which 
you know, it might sound strange, but a lot of people are watching it. They want to know how to clean their phones. They want to know what options. You know, if I spray something on, is the anti will the anti back wipe um, actually damage it? Okay. Sorry about that. So finally, we're going to go into funding and supports. And so I've given you a list of funding and supports there, and I won't go through them because they're very detailed. But what I would say is, there's a link at the bottom of it, it's the SME online tool. And I'm going to give you recommendations for the trading online voucher and the innovation voucher, because they're the best ones for SMEs to start with. Um, but if you're looking for other funds, the SME online tool is the one that you should be looking at. And then we're just going to just give you a couple of different um, options for your recommendations, and then we'll do a Q&A. So the one thing I could say to you is create your custom hashtag for all your platforms. So for us, we have TW Innovation, and it's capital TU, capital V, capital I. No one else has used it. I search all the platforms. So now whenever anyone actually posts TW Innovation for anything, they refer back to the original accounts where I did it. So to our Twitter, LinkedIn, our website, you'll see that hashtag. It's also on, on our branded items. Anything that you get from us will have TUW innovation on it. I've also built in other hashtags that are very specific custom hashtags for us. And they're the ones that when people post about it, you, if you get them to start sharing that hashtag, then you'll get all the content feed. It's also a way for you to track the analytics. It's really good. So have a personality. Tell a story that your customers want to hear, but be personable, be interesting, be, be different, differentiate yourself. If your customers are seeing the same thing, same, same day, same industry, they're all saying the same thing, they're going to just turn their brain off. They don't care, you know. But if you have something like Weechbex did, and you've actually done something that is topical, we're still speaking about it. I mean, I had emails across the board about, we, have you seen the Weechbex challenge? I had messages. People are sharing it on all my platforms. It's a bit of fun, and it's a bit of debatability in this um, highly saturated market for social media. And then very much listen to your customer and respond to them. If your customers are not happy, make sure you just, you're not ignoring them. Make sure that you actually respond to them, but you're building customer loyalty by engaging with them. So if they have questions, respond to them. If they are sharing your content, thank them, do something, you know, engage with them and build your customer loyalty by that engagement by the customer side. And through that, you actually build your brand awareness and you'll build up your products, your process, services, and your business overall and people will purchase from you. So I've given you contact details, but I just want to say thank you very much. If you do want to get in touch with me and you want to follow up with it, I am happy to take your, your questions. Um, but if you want to follow up afterwards and you need more detailed information, uh, that's my email and contact details. Thank and you, Danielle. Yeah. Just there was one, we were going to just ask them a poll, uh, I think, just in terms oh, of. Apologies, I forgot there's a third poll. Yes, if you want to do that, I'll stop sharing my screen. We'll just ask very briefly uh, to. Um, uh, Now, can we see that, folks? We'll just give it one second, and then we'll, we'll progress no to the questions. Give you a moment to um, catch your breath after that powerful gallop through the digital landscape. I know there's a lot to take in. I was trying to get as much as I possibly could for you over it, but I do have, I mean, each one of those slides, you could actually do a presentation nearly on all of them, you know, but this was kind of just an overview of what you could get. It's a busy, a busy space and it's, a, you know, mm. getting large the whole time. And it's incredible the advent of some of those uh, platforms. TikTok, as a case in point, has really gone mega, as indeed WhatsApp over the last four or five years has really kind of jumped into the communication space to an extraordinary degree. Um, and, you know, we see that ourselves. And even over the last period of nine months, we're on a Zoom platform, which everyone to a large degree mm. has become quite um, comfortable with now, where if we were predicting this, um, you know, we would okay. have seen that. Well, I see the, the poll has stopped there. I'm just looking at it. the um, e-commerce and funding seem to be leading the same with referrals. Um, so we can talk about e-commerce and funding if you'd like um, in the sure. 
I, I don't see I was the chat is in the bottom. The one thing I would say about TikTok, just be careful with it. I signed up for TikTok because I'm I'm actually on all the platforms, the market man journey to be aware of all the platforms and to understand them and to I don't engage in TikTok, but I've now become some sort of a stalker on TikTok because they, I'm following these amazing, they funny people. So you lose hours of your life. Just just be aware of that, you know, just looking at some of the videos and laughing away at yourself. And people think you're crazy because you're laughing away at yourself. Yeah, just okay. Just keep that in mind if you do sign up for these platforms. That's so. okay, Danielle. It, it's, you know, you get a, an absolution from Lockberg <laughs> this year. It's probably time better spent than, than on tenants for time served. A couple of questions coming in, okay? Sure. And uh, I think maybe just to run them by you as they've cascaded in. So um, what's the ideal length for a, um, a video snapshot in terms of a product or a service? Um, you know, if you're doing one, either on TikTok or whatever, YouTube, what's the ideal sure. kind of elevator pitch? No problem. If you are doing a video, I would say keep it to about a minute and a half. I am two minutes absolute max. People just lose interest. They have no capacity for the amount of information. If you can get it done in a minute, that's great. But this platforms have certain amounts of time. So Twitter and TikTok actually cut you off at a certain amount of time. So if you can do a product um, demonstration or showcase within that. However, YouTube give you a much longer time and you can say to them at the end of your video, if you want to learn more, you can see our in-depth video on YouTube. But the other platforms, yeah, keep to about a minute, minute and a half. Okay. And just a, a kind of a, a very technical question in terms of press releases as a case in mm -hmm. point, if you're sending them out, would you include it in the body of an email or attach it or use link? What, what would be, you know, and the whole air debate. Oh, the video, is it? Is, yeah. Yeah, okay, so press releases, they have a specific breakdown. So at the very top, you would actually have a title page. Sorry, a title of what the press release is. And make sure that title is nearly under 10 words, I would say, would probably be the max you'd want to do on your title. But make sure it's an impactful title that people want to read. And the first paragraph, if you're not getting your content across and what you're trying to say in your first paragraph, your customers aren't going to read it. The, the followers of the press aren't going to read it. And honestly, the journalists aren't going to read it. So... If your first paragraph doesn't say what you wanted to say, then don't, just don't bother sending the press release. I would put in a couple of quotes into it, quotes from people who are either testimonials or about what the product process or services, and then cap it at maybe probably about four paragraphs, um, five paragraphs at the absolute most. But in the section below, so you stop it and you put a section that says editor's notes. And anyone who is a journalist or, or in press releases understands what editor's notes is. That's when you can put as much content as you want in there. You can put in all about your company, all about your services, contact details, other impact stats that they might be aware of. Because sometimes journalists like to use follow-up pieces and they use that content for it. You can put the links to your videos there. Okay. No, do not put it into the main audio. Okay. So, Daniel, just a question that came in. You'd be happy to know on another platform, WhatsApp just came in there mm -hmm. um, from one of our uh, co colleagues uh, in Canada. And they were just asking in terms of Twitter, just, yeah. uh, you know, selling on Twitter, it, it hadn't outside of, I guess, you know, Twitter was saved by our, our recently and nearly departed American president, Mr. Trump. Uh, at that point, it was, it was I suppose, um, you know, moving away from the, the center space and it had come back right back into the mix and it's very much there now. And the demographics you shared with us would show that. So selling on Twitter, I mean, I noticed that Twitter has a, has a business platform and a, a personal platform. Mm -hmm. um, and I see promoted ads coming up on Twitter. And I guess my, my colleague has asked the question, how, you know, how do you see selling on Twitter or what's the best way of going about that? Do you, do you take a business account or personal account or what's your view? Uh, pretty much all Twitter accounts are uh, business accounts in some way because we interact with the businesses in, it depends on if you are promoting yourself as a business or an individual. So I have both. But my personal account is actually a business account for me because I am the marketing manager. So when people search for us, I get hit quite a lot. So my LinkedIn and my Twitter are kept as professional accounts. Mm -hmm. If you're selling online, only sell through a business account. And even if your personal account is there, make sure that when they search for you, because you might be down as the owner and you might have a personal account, just make sure there's nothing damaging that they could have for your brand. You can do personalized ads and you can do professional ads on it. And they cost about, I think it's about 20 euros to run a generic ad on Twitter. But you're better if you get user generated content and you're sharing that content, then you are to do a personalized ad on it. But what I would say is um, pay for some of the ads, but mostly you want the user-generated content that people are sharing. Twitter is not a great 
platform to do a sales pitch on. Um, it's better if you've got the interactivity rather than the paid ads. And I just, he just give me a, a second question there. He's really hogging mm -hmm. it. Uh, the blue tick. How do you get the blue ticks? Ah, yes, they've stopped the blue ticks. Okay, ah. so the, yeah, the blue ticks, will, they'll only give them to um, people like the president or anything like that. But for businesses, no, they've stopped them all. Uh, even if you have legitimate followings and you've shown them that um, you're a business and you've registered, you, like they used to ask you for your your registered, like your serial um, registration papers. They used to ask you for like bills and that kind of stuff. And they used to give the, the, the tick marks, but no, they've stopped it. And we put in a request for um, TU Dublin uh, because we're a legitimate account for TU Dublin and they've actually stopped all of it. So they'll be bringing it back. But as of now, everyone is looking for them, but no, you you would need a major following and to be someone like the president to get that blue tick, yeah. So, Danielle, just an, another question, I suppose, uh, that, that comes to mind in terms of, and you touched on it briefly, you know, we're in the commission of uh, consultancy and a lot, of, a lot of that is professional services. But mm -hmm. on the product portfolio, a lot of our colleagues would maybe be writing books or sharing knowledge in that space or, or putting yep. up video content that they might be re reselling and so forth. Book and talk. The, the which? Book talk. Book talk. Okay. That's the actual um, hashtag. Yeah. I didn't know that. So that's 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 a part of the question. Book talk. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. the, just, I suppose, what we've seen over the last month since Brexit, just to that point you made earlier about Amazon and the difficulty of getting on Amazon, which, mm -hmm. you know, originally was vested as a book selling entity uh, and people are kind of self-publishing. But what's your view on Amazon.de? They have started um, blocking Amazon.de and there's actual... Um, there's there's people using i got an email yesterday about actually about the jerusalem dance um because we got one of the lectures emailing me to see could they use it what would the copyright protections be but now they're actually the german um warner brothers are actually there's, there's a whole there's a whole thing i saw that yeah 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 so what they're doing is they're blocking people from using it so right now they're saying that we have to use amazon.co.uk but we don't when you come in, there's different charges that are coming in through it. What I would say is Amazon are probably going to move into the Irish market. That's mm. what their, their their movement is. And I'd say in the next year to two years, they're going to have an Amazon.ie. I suppose that the reason why why that would be kind of the Amazon Prime, uh, where a lot of members would be on it and they're mm -hmm. getting free delivery out of the UK at that point. It doesn't yeah. really germinate. No, and you won't get the, the Amazon Prime is still working for you right now, but I would get in before... I want to say the 24th of February, I think that was what the deadline cost off was um, for Prime, but have a look at it. They have, they have the actual um, different breakdowns on it at the moment. If you're selling through Amazon, I would probably still use the UK market, even if you are liable for it. Going through okay. the market adds in extra delivery times and your customers are not going to wait for it. And honestly, most people don't understand the Amazon.de at a customer level rather than the business level. So they're still going through the .co.uk market. Okay, and in, in terms of, there's an, another, uh, that's a text come in there now, funnily enough, in terms of sharing content, um, can you mm -hmm. overshare or at what point, I mean, do you, do you yeah, cascade yes, over? Like the saturated content, yeah. What I would say is, if you're sharing every day, then it has to be relevant. So don't share every day. Try and find times that suit you. For us, the mornings work really well and Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays work really well. Fridays are really bad for us, so we tend not to share anything unless it's content that we just want to, you know, just to post something, just to have something up there. Um, I tend to post three times a week on Twitter and LinkedIn. We do once a week on our website. And honestly, we don't post on our website because we're in the middle of, um, God, it's awful. With the TU brand, we are held on a DIT website until we can get the new website up and running, which hopefully will be in the next six months same six months if i was a company i'd have a new website up and running but unfortunately we're a part of the tw um brands redesign so what i would say is find a medium that's good for you for us it's once a week on our platforms on our website it's once a week for a shared email throughout all the college and it's about three times a week for our specific platforms unless there's something going on so you would have seen at the twitter event that we had or sorry the open apps event we had i had like seven posts on twitter which is very much crazy for us but we were sharing specifics for that event so we would share out that content for that area uh, but no find 
find a, a happy medium you'll, you'll start to notice like you, all of them have analytics so you could be able to track that and ana those analytics to make sure that you're not oversaturating your hands and people aren't getting fed up with you okay well look thank you i'm conscious of your time and uh, really powerful uh, knowledge sharing this morning you did a deep dive in a very short space and covered a lot of ground so gramila mila mahagat um, I guess what I would say is we'll be um, sharing this uh, uh, presentation uh, to the, the mm -hmm. members of the Institute afterwards. And uh, again, uh, we're looking forward to um, touching base with you again, Danielle, in due course, please God, later in the year when we're in more convivial circumstances. And to that end, we will be having another event coming up with uh, the economist Jim Power uh, in um, March, March 4th. And he's going to actually take a look at the first couple of days of Brexit and uh, the new American presidency and where the Irish economy is. So that'll be just an interesting snapshot as we head into, into the Ides of March. So um, colleagues and friends and uh, clients and guests and uh, on behalf of everyone, Danielle, um, really, really appreciate your time. And uh, I hope everyone keeps safe and uh, stays, uh, stays in good order. So remember to wear your masks and wash your hands. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you on the 4th of March. So um, Shana Will, it's long before everyone. Thanks, Bye. Danielle. Thank God you. Bless. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.